All right, I think that's uh, enough time for those of you that are, have joined us already. Um, if there's anybody that is coming a little bit later, we'll make sure to you know have a recording for us so we can send it out to those. Um, so for those of you that are here already, thank you very much for being here with us today for our spring of virtual open house, uh, specifically for the Department of Humanities and Politics here at Nova Southeastern University. My name is Brett McAllister. I'm the uh, Director for Graduate Admissions here for the Hamilton College of Arts and Sciences that this department resolves in. Um, with me, as always, is multiple members of my team. We have Mr. Theodore Uwe, who I'm sure many of you have spoken with as well, uh, as Ms. Megan Troy, one of my assistant directors, and uh, Ms. Farah Amro, as well as one of our other admissions um, counselors with us, as well as uh, Dr. Um, Ransford Edwards, who we'll be speaking with as well. You'll be hearing from a couple of different things before he, with his very busy schedule, has to move on to one of the teaching classes. So hopefully we will be able to um, move forward quickly for him as well. Um, so first, I'd like to thank you once again for being here to discuss um, the Masters of Science in National um, Security Affairs and International Relations. Um, it's a really exciting degree taught in a variety of avenues. We do have some other degrees here as well with the Helmholtz College of Arts and Sciences, everything from the Master of Arts in Composition of Rhetoric and Digital Media, obviously, as we just mentioned, National Security Affairs Master's degree, as well as some Biological Sciences degrees, Marine Sciences, Conflict Analysis, Resolution Studies, Medicinal Chemistry, um, a Master's of Professional Science in Environmental Sciences, as well as two doctoral degrees in Conflict Analysis and Oceanography and Marine Biology. Now, we do also have two different campuses. One of our main campuses is over um, in Davie, Florida, um, which is a large, beautiful building. And obviously the picture that we have there, that is our five-story Alvin Sherman Library that is one of the largest public libraries of access in the state of Florida. I believe it's third largest at the last check-in. Um, it's also where I'm attached to that as one of the visual performing arts centers, which is a great view of the main campus. It looks fantastic as always. As well as the other building that we do have is for you guys will be the Hollywood and Mailman and the Carl DeSantis building. Um, as well as, 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 sorry, I mentioned to me as well, is we have the University Center as well that's attached to that building as well. And then the next buildings I was just talking about, I do apologize, skipping a little bit early on you there, Teddy, is the Mailman Hollywood building on the left side, and the Carl DeSantis building is on the right. For a variety of classroom experiences, depending on, you know, what classes you'll be taking for this program, you'll be in those two of those buildings potentially as well. I do want to also introduce uh, the department chair, um, Dr. David Kilroy, who I believe will not be joining us this evening. He is on a busy schedule. Um, but as the chair for Humanities and Politics, he wants to make sure to welcome everyone to our open house, specifically for the Masters of Science in National Security Affairs and International Relations. The Department of Humanities and Politics prides itself on providing students with the necessary tools to engage a diverse, dynamic, and globalized world through a range of interdisciplinary programs at both the graduate and undergraduate levels. The interdisciplinary master's program in national security, I mean, excuse me, national security affairs and international relations is an excellent case in point. From terrorism to cybersecurity, climate change to global pandemics, uh, the program takes a real holistic view of national security within the broader context of international relations and engages students in these issues through the disciplinary lenses of political science, history, legal studies, and philosophy. Uh, NSAIR provides excellent preparation for students aspiring to a career in national security or international relations and those considering you know, further academic study in the field. Now, normally from here, I would turn it over to Dr. Kilroy for, so he could introduce Dr. Edwards, but I'm going to take it one step further for introducing um, you, Dr. Edwards, since you do need introduction, whether you like it or not. So with us, as I mentioned before, is Dr. Edwards. Um, now, he's been with us for a long time, and I've worked with him on many different projects, and he's always fascinating to speak with. So I'll let him do a little more of the introduction on himself. But Dr. Edwards, thank you so much for being here with us tonight to talk to some of our students, um, those that are watching currently and those who are watching later. So Dr. Edwards, with that, floor is yours. Thank you once again for being here. All right. Thank you, Brett, um, Teddy, Megan, the entire team. Really appreciate it. So I am not the previous handsome guy. I am the mediocre looking guy um, that you see on the screen right now. Um, so I teach in the, the NSAIA program, and I am also the coordinator of the program. Um, so welcome aboard. And again, thank you for your interest in our program. Just a brief background on me. I have a bachelor's degree from Florida Atlantic University in political science. I have a master's degree 
from Florida State University in political science. And I have a PhD from Florida International University in, you guessed it, political science. Um, so that is what I bring to the table in this particular program. But we have a variety of faculty with a variety of interests, as you as you will see on the next slide. Perfect. And again, I don't know how I'm looking, right? I'm on my coming to you from my phone. Um, so again, so some of our areas of specialty, um, genetics and genealogy, we have Latin American literature, US foreign relations, border security, literature and film, American legal and constitutional history, um, literary theory. My emphasis is disaster politics, but also international political economy and so much more. We have a faculty, we have a faculty member um, that spent over 20 years on a nuclear submarine, right? So um, we have a lot of interest in faculty um, that are specialized and highly interested and motivated to serve your needs. So we'll get into some of the, absolutely. So we'll get into some of our, our program in general. So we have a variety of courses, right? You know, 21 core credits and you will have 15 um, electives. Let me go to the next slide. I'll cover some of those um, later. All right, so the program generally, 24 month curriculum. Now that varies, obviously this is based on your dedication, your motivation. You could possibly get it done sooner. Um, we give you conceptual and practical work focus. Um, tonight, I have a course in international relations, theory and practice. Um, and we'll be actually talking about Ukraine and Russia. And spoiler alert, Russia is not entirely off base with invading Ukraine, but that's that's for another time. That's for when you take that particular course. Uh, we also have the option of cybersecurity concentration. And as Brett pointed out, um, we, we are located I'm currently in North Florida campus. My course is hybrid. So while I have students in class, if you are um, remote, you can log in via Zoom and we have a synchronous meeting. Um, so I was very excited about that, that duality. And we have, a, again, exciting um, program curriculum, including courses like terrorism um, and international law. Actually, coming up in the summer, I'll be teaching that course on terrorist and terrorism. So, right, again, very exciting stuff and very excited to have you in some of these courses. All right, some of the elective courses that makes up the, well, this is, sorry, the core courses. Um, you have um, current historical issues, border protection, U.S. foreign policy, national security, and my course, international relations, theory, and practice. Also ethical issues in national security, and national intelligence um, collection. So that's a, a, a slate of our um, core courses. And we also have a variety of elective courses that you may find interesting. And some of these include international law and institutions, cyber conflict and statecraft, economic statecraft and national security, which I teach it, which fundamentally is about international political economy, trade sanctions and whatnot. Um, we also have special topics in national security in 2019, we went to Cuba and we did um, an in-depth study on the Cuba Missile Crisis, right? So we did some soaking and poking in Havana, uh, which was interesting. And we have a directed thesis. Um, and just to give you, well, yeah, just to give you some feedback on that, um, it's easy to get into a program, but sometimes it's hard to get out. Um, and the two ways to get out is either you take a comprehensive exam at the end of your coursework, or you write a thesis project. Um, I would suggest you do the, the thesis option because you will, at the end of that um, two semester sequence, you would have created knowledge. And I think that is unique um, to become a published author. So when anyone Googles your name or Googles your topic, you will come up and you will be cited um, as, again, a, a, an academic scholar. So you'd write the thesis, you'll pick a thesis advisor and a couple faculty readers, and you will embark upon an intellectual academic journey, which I think will, will change your life. Um, so that's obviously something that right you should definitely start thinking about, particularly in your early courses like research and evaluation. Um, so let's talk about some of um, 
some of our other courses in the cybersecurity concentration. So again, so this course, you have to complete nine credit hours from this six. This includes fundamentals of security technologies, information security governance, and information security projects. So again, we have a vast curriculum, right, with core classes, electives, and optional cybersecurity concentration. Um, I would love to see you here. I would love for you to send all my classes. Um, and again, I'm very excited to, to see you in the summer or upcoming fall. Thanks so much, Dr. Edwards. So there's a couple of different people you'll get to know from the graduate admissions office. Uh, you'll most likely be dealing with me as I handle our applications for the Master's of Science program in National Affairs. Now, uh, anyone else you see on screen here, as well as some other people you don't see on screen, are able to assist you with general graduate admissions questions, whether that be about the application or the program itself. Uh, we do have a general contact line for 954-262-8066, but we can contact our students over email, text, and we even do video conference as well, if you would prefer. So... Looking at some of the general application deadlines for the MS in National Security Affairs and International Relations program, we do rolling admissions, so we accept students for the summer, fall, and winter terms. Uh, the next applicable term coming up is going to be summer 2024, and that's going to be for April 12th as a deadline. Uh, that'll be a Friday, so we try and have it more towards the end of the week so that you have more time to get in any of your remaining materials. Uh, where the vast majority of our students usually apply is for the incoming fall term. Uh, so for that date, you're going to be looking at July 19th as your deadline. That's going to fall on a Friday again. Uh, a little further out, looking at the winter term, which for us, usually starts with the new year, give or take a couple of days there with the holidays. But if you'd be looking a little bit further out to apply, we're still setting the exact deadline, but that will be in around mid-November of 2024 here. So for the specifics of the application requirements, you're first going to have a general NSU application. We're going to break down what that looks like here in just a little bit. Uh, but part of that, that you're going to have areas like your biographic and demographic information, some of your prior college information, and there's a couple of legal disclosures in there as well. Now, we are going to need official transcripts from any previously attended higher education institution. So even if you got one credit from a community college, we still need a separate transcript from them. Uh, you must have your institution or an approved third party vendor like Parchment, for example, send over those transcripts. We cannot accept the transcripts, at least as official copies, if they come from you as the applicant. Now, you're also going to have two letters of recommendation that you'll submit. One thing to keep in mind as you go through the application, you are first going to have to submit the general application before you can submit any of those other remaining items like the transcripts, the letters of recommendation, as well as our essay and writing sample. So with those two letters of recommendation, after you submitted the general application portion, there will be a new field that appears where you can submit the emails for your intended recommenders. They will be sent an electronic form to fill out and attach their written letter to and send that back to us. If you have any issues with that, feel free to contact the office and we can troubleshoot that as necessary. Ideally, we would like to see these recommendations coming from academic sources, such as past professors, advisors, maybe even program directors, but we will accept professional letters as well. Uh, our only tip when it comes to using professional sources is to make sure that their letter of recommendation can stay relevant to you as a student applying for a master's program. You know, sometimes we get uh, letters of recommendation, you know, that says, you know, Joe is a really great hard worker at Outback Steakhouse, but that doesn't exactly give us exactly what we're looking for in terms of a letter of recommendation. So any more applicable experience, traits, characteristics that they can talk about you as a student does you uh, all the more beautifully when it comes to building your application. Then you're going to have an admissions essay that's going to be anywhere from 500 to 1,000 words at maximum, uh, detailing more of your interest within the program, any professional goals, as well as anything else that you would actually want uh, the larger program office to know about you as an applicant. All the while, you're going to have an academic writing sample, and that could be anything from uh, a past uh, journal article write-up assignment, maybe a larger personal essay, or or could even be maybe a uh, bachelor's level thesis that you wanted. We are willing to accept all, as long as you think it does an ample job at describing you as a writer. And then our ideal candidate is sitting at around a 3.0. Uh, while we look at that, you know, there is some flexibility within that. So that's why this is a larger uh, application package. So we want to be able to take a look at your writing skills in addition to that quantitative data given from a transcript. So even if you're not sitting right around that 3.0 range, but you're pretty close, we definitely can still look into your application. Now, 
this is going to be the application overview. So once you go and create an account with us, you're going to come into this first part, which usually will then be populated from some general information that you put together on the account creation. There's going to be a couple of different pieces to note over here. So if you do ever have any issues with your account, uh, maybe you can't start an application or some of the functions aren't working properly on your overview screen, we do have a help IT desk. So they have a phone number being 1-800-541-6682 or their email is sharkitservices at nova.edu. Uh, to an extent, we can sometimes help with those issues here in admissions, but if we cannot help, they're going to be the next best people to talk to. Now, first up, uh, so your section for an application is going to be your biographic information. This is generally a straightforward area, anywhere from your date of birth, address, any affiliation with the university, and so forth. Uh, but we want to make sure that you're putting in uh, this kind of uh, correct uh, information. It's hard for us to change this later on once the account is actually created, so we need to make sure that we're using the correct data. Uh, more often, we want to make sure that the email address associated with your account is one that you will always have accessibility to. So generally, we like to recommend that you don't use a, a university-related email when you're creating the application. Uh, that's just because at some point or another, you may lose access to that university email, and we're going to be sending important information for updates on your application, as well as your actual decision to that email later on. So the next portion is going to be our program application information. So more so here, uh, again, it's just going to be out double checking the data that you're inputting into your fields, right? So making sure that you put the correct entry term. Uh, that's a little bit easier to us uh, for us to fix later on. But of course, we want to make sure you're getting the exact term that you're wanting to actually start in. Uh, if in any case you go and submit that application and pay the $50 fee, you will still have that active for one academic year, which means if at any point you need to defer your application to a later term so you have a little bit more time to work on it, uh, we have flexibility within that as well. Now, when you're looking into your campus of study, remember that this program is offered both online and in person. And as Dr. Edwards stated a little bit earlier, we have hybrid uh, modality based classes. So you want to make sure that you're choosing the correct campus of study for your program application. Then we're going to look into our prior college information. So any students that are still completing their undergraduate degree have to be within their final semester of their bachelor's degree program in order to be reviewed. Uh, that usually means if you're on your uh, general standard path and you're going to be graduating in the springtime that we have to have at least your fall grades of your senior year put into your transcript before we can officially review you. And then if admitted to the program, we would need to get one final copy that does show your bachelor's degree conferral before you can start the program officially. Now, in order for those transcripts to be considered official, as we were discussing earlier, that must come from your institution itself or one of the approved uh, third party vendors like Parchment, uh, ScriptSafe, or the National Student Clearinghouse. If you've taken any college credit at a non-U.S. institution, it must be evaluated for U.S. equivalency college credit. And that is done through what's called the National Association of Credential Evaluation Services, or NACES for short. Uh, there are multiple organizations that are part of the NACES membership, so any one of them can help you do that evaluation report. If you do need that evaluation, it needs a couple of different parts of information to be uh, usable for our reporting and review. And that's going to include having your cumulative GPA listed along with a course by course analysis with the U.S. grade equivalent. And if a degree was conferred at that institution, it must state when that happened as well. Any of those transcripts, once they are ready, can be sent electronically uh, via email to electronictranscript.nova.edu, or if it must be sent in the mail, you can let us know and we'll send you the physical address for our processing office. Then we're going to be looking into the admissions document section. So this is going to be the portion of the application that you will typically get to once you submit that general application portion. Now keep in mind, Paying that $50 fee and submitting the general application does not mean your application is complete. It's just essentially the first portion. The admissions document section, which we're seeing on screen over here, is essentially the next part. So over here, you're going to be able to track to see when the college transcripts were received, if the letters of recommendation have been sent out, looked at, and then completed back, as well as being able to directly upload some other items, such as your writing sample, your resume, as well as your personal statement. Now, Ideally, we do recommend those to be Word documents for the upload process. Sometimes we have issues with other type of Word types, but if you have any concern with that, just let us know. 
For those letters of recommendation, you can actually have up to three letters if you would like, but the minimum requirement is two. Uh, that email gets sent out through an automated system. So sometimes it can act as a kind of spam alert for certain email security protocols. So always have your advisor, or excuse me, recommender check their uh, junk or spam box just in case if they haven't received the email in the first 24 hours. Otherwise, you can send them directly to us and we'll have them uploaded to your account. Most of the time when uh, documents are coming in, say we get transcripts that are being received, uh, can take anywhere from three to five business days for the processing time. But most of the time it's rather quickly for electronic files. So usually around 24 to 48 hours. Now, looking into the cost of attendance for the program, the per credit hour rate is going to be around uh, $830 per credit. Our typical student is going to be taking six credits per semester, uh, which is equivalent to two courses. So that is the average course load for a graduate student, and that is also at full-time status. So a part of that, you also incur over one academic year around $1,800 in a student services fee. Well, that's split among your three academic terms, again, being fall, winter, and summer. So that's $600 per semester. That student services fee will cover everything that you're going to utilize as a student, whether it be our online juridical database subscriptions, access to our, our software programs that you utilize for some of your classes, e-text versions and citations, or any other sort of resource owned by the university. That's all kind of compiled in that student services fee. There's not really too many other fees that you will incur during your time as a student. The only ones that may fall into play uh, as necessary may say be like student health requirements. So we do have a health insurance requirement for all students, which you are automatically enrolled into once you are admitted to this program and choose to enroll. But if you have your own applicable health insurance, or maybe you say you're still with like a family, for instance, you can usually get that waived. Now, looking into scholarship opportunities. Now, when you're looking online, uh, first off, uh, you do have to first be admitted to our program before you can apply for any scholarship or paid position. But there are a few different scholarships that you can take a look into. Uh, through the Halmos College of Arts and Sciences, which this program is underneath, we have several different types of scholarship offerings. We have institutional-wide scholarships, which are have general-based criteria for just being an enrolled student at the university. We have college-wide scholarships, which means that you have to be enrolled under a specific college under the university umbrella. So in this case, it would be under the Halmos College. And then we have department-specific scholarships. So we have uh, eight different departments that fall underneath the Halmos College of Arts and Sciences. You guys would be looking at our Department of Humanities and Politics for scholarship offerings. And just a couple that you may be interested in looking into are listed here on screen, which do include uh, the Stoltzenberg Doan Scholarship, our Chancellor's Fellow Scholarship, and the Wei Chen Endowed Scholarship. Now, for any of those listed opportunities, you do have to read through some of the different uh, criteria listed on the scholarship. Most of them have their own unique application process. So uh, anytime that you have questions regarding these scholarships or how that application looks like, or maybe you just want to know if you're actually even uh, eligible to apply for it, there is a general email that the Halmos College utilizes to answer any questions regarding these scholarships. So depending on which one that you're looking to get answers on, a different individual here under the university umbrella will then call, or, or excuse me, answer to that. And so that email is monitored by a variety of different deans, faculty members, program advisors, so on and so forth. And of course, we would definitely love for you to follow us on social media. Uh, we try and put on blast all the time we have any sort of events happening, whether it be virtual or, or in person. Uh, most of our platforms, you can find us at NSU HCAS or the Hamos College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, once we get this edited, we'll have this posted up to our YouTube as well, if you'd like to go back and watch it. But uh, at this time, I would love to open up the floor to questions if you have any at this time. Oh, and uh, Dr. Edwards here does have to leave for his own class, but if you guys did have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or the Q&A portion, and we can send them over to him and Dr. Kilroy, and they can answer back to you guys directly. Alrighty, well, I won't hold us for that long. If you do think of any other questions later on, or if you just want to get access to the YouTube link later on, once we have it posted, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, my email directly again is tu44 at nova.edu, or you can just give us a call at 954-262-8066. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Oh, wait. 
Oh, we do have a question, Teddy. Ah, yep, sorry, perfect. I was going to catch you real quick. <laughs> yep. All right, so we do have an anonymous question, Teddy. I'll read it out for you. I'm sure you can probably answer it. Um, how many courses do you recommend we take per semester? And how many semesters does it take to finish the degree? Great question. So uh, usually it's recommended that you can take two courses per semester. Now, if you would like to, you can go up to nine credits, which would be three classes. Typically when they do that, uh, or when students are interested in doing that, they are recommended to speak with our academic advisor for the program. Her name is Claudette Brooks, or uh, say with Dr. Edwards, who was with us just a little bit earlier. He's our graduate advisor, as well as a program coordinator. So they usually just want to make sure that you can handle the increased course load, that you understand what you're getting into in terms of uh, actual study time and everything that comes with those classes. So the recommended is going to be two classes or six credits, and that is typically completed in uh, two full academic years. So you're completing 18 credits per year on that uh, route, and then you would then complete the full 36 by that end of that time. Uh, now, as Dr. Uh, Edwards was also saying, uh, there being two different paths for graduation, you have your general culminating exam, which would happen in your final semester of the program, or what he usually likes to recommend is doing the master's thesis. Now, depending on how your uh, research is going with the thesis, you may have to take a little bit longer. So sometimes he says you may add in one extra semester depending on if it's necessary, but uh, generally speaking, you're still able to complete it within that larger two-year time span. All right. Wonderful. Awesome. And I, I do like to mention as well, Tay, before we sign it off, um, for those of you who are, you know, are with us in person uh, currently right now and those watching later, we do have some more events coming up further down the road. So keep an eye out for those. We'll, you know, send them out through email or our social media posts, but feel free to keep an eye out for more things coming down as we get, um, you know, closer towards the end of the semester. So again, Teddy, thank you for, you know, taking over, taking the lead right there. And for those of you who are here tonight, thank you once again for being here. From my staff and those of us here at NSC, you have something, Teddy. What's up? Yeah. One more. One more. Uh, oh, so, we have another question. Perfect. Okay. Uh, what would a final exam entail and how is it different from the thesis? Is it like an open essay format or multiple choice mix? So uh, I believe they uh, are, or excuse me, when I say they, the program offices has discretion in how they change the culminating exam. But as I understand it, it is a mixture format of multiple choice as well as open essay format. They generally lean more towards uh, open essay formats with writing prompts, as that is largely a part of the style of uh, work that you do in a part of this program. Um, now, the thesis itself, uh, generally speaking, it takes over a two semester time span, but you would choose a major advisor and subsequent uh, thesis committee uh, that would assist with your general research. Now, most of the time, then you're going to be guided through your major advisor. So when you're working with them, you usually are going to be uh, solidifying your advisor as someone that falls under the uh, field on which you're looking uh, to do your thesis topic on. So uh, say Dr. Edwards, for example, he would be perfect for international, excuse me, international relations and uh, say the effects they're in on some of the different uh, economic impacts from some surrounding nations. So he's just one example of that. And then subsequently you choose, I believe, two or three other faculty member to comprise your larger committee. And then mm -hmm. they all assist in the general process flow over those next two semesters as your uh, thesis starts to take shape. Um, as necessary, you may have some more uh, larger activities for uh, collecting that research. And maybe that entails going out into the larger community to gather data or looking through some of the larger networks of the faculty um, to gather some of that, or our own reference material and citations to compose the background knowledge board. Is there a location to view potential courses? I've seen a short list online, but is there a comprehensive portal or is that only available on enrollment? So uh, the program office generally keeps the master list, the one, that you can generally use on the like public web front is going to be called NSU Course Wizard. Uh, I recommend just reaching out to our office because it's a little finicky and how you have to choose the correct filters in order to view those courses. Um, so we're more than happy to send over the direct, uh, direct link for that. But yes, there is always at least one course offered in person, but there's usually uh, two to three offered every single semester to choose from or actually, I think it might even be four. Um, kind of depends. Most of the time, if it's closer to the fall, they have a little bit larger of a selection. And then the winter and summer um, ones are based more on an even odd year basis for certain course offerings. 
You can also uh, contact us and we have a curriculum sheet where you can see the full list of different courses that comprise the program or then uh, the larger details are within our ca course catalog. Um, not necessarily, sorry, excuse me, uh, I should preface. Uh, if a course is offered in person, does that mean it won't be offered online that same semester? Um, not necessarily. So many of these classes are truly offered in hybrid modality. So as necessary, students that need to take it online can, and those who wish to take it in person can also do so. It'll still just happen uh, synchronously. So it's still going to be happening at the same time. So uh, within that, uh, you'll have flexibility to really choose your core and elective class work. Um, I usually will recommend students after they're admitted coming closer to their entry term to make sure they stay in contact with Claudette Brooks uh, as your academic advisor. She usually is the one who likes to break down a larger plan of study in connection with Dr. Edwards being your program coordinator. Uh, so usually uh, my recommendation once you have questions regarding say a specific course setup is that you reach out to our, our faculty advisor or academic advisor. Oh, oh. yeah. Perfect. <laughs> oh, on the concentrations. Yes. Um, let me go back here so that you can actually see it. I apologize. I don't mean to keep cutting it short. If you do actually have questions, they're just coming in uh, very slowly. One second. So with the courses, uh, say with the concentration, so the cybersecurity concentration, uh, you only are required to take nine credits from this concentration. There's five different classes offered in total being uh, 15 credits. So if you'd like, you can choose from a variety. Now, uh, there's a couple of things that the faculty uh, want students to keep in mind as they look into the cybersecurity concentration. In its present form, it is more technical in nature. While we do not require the students to come from an IT background in order to take these classes, it does very much assist you in being able to better comprehend the uh, relationships between the larger theoretical portions and implications of cybersecurity with the technical side. But what um, the uh, program office is looking into changing uh, with this concentration is largely then putting it back towards the theoretical component as they more want to focus on that piece of how cybersecurity inter uh, excuse me interlates itself or with national security affairs and the larger program. So these courses themselves are actually taught through our College of Computing and Engineering and not through the Helmholtz College of Arts and Sciences. That's why they usually still recommend students have a little bit of a background within the technical sphere if they do want to take on these courses. But the cybersecurity concentration is definitely uh, one that they are looking to bolster within the program as it is a huge sphere into the larger international relations sphere, especially within the growing uh, world that is our, uh, you know, AI technology and larger spheres that just continue to grow and how, uh, inter excuse me, technology interlaces with our everyday lives. But then on the uh, larger elective coursework, one second here. On the larger elective coursework, we have quite a range of classes, and we look to have different uh, ways to have you really take on these course offerings. So what you'll see is, of course, your general, uh, say, theoretical courses, a lot more uh, larger discussions and looking at uh, actual live events happening, say, in areas like international law, cyber conflict, and like their directed readings in national security affairs. But then you have more hands-on practical classes that look to get you out into more field-based experience. And that can be done through larger community-based networks. We also have done uh, supervised field experience out to larger uh, nations and in, in the global community, uh, like going down to Cuba or over in Africa, uh, sometimes uh, even, uh, I believe, over to the Middle East and into uh, the larger East. And then, of course, uh, Dr. Edwards is always our advocate for the directed thesis part. Are most of the classes offered during the day or are there any evening classes as well? 
So our uh, typical classes are usually going to happen after that larger nine to five time span, because uh, we usually have this as a class that's available uh, for working adults as well. So we want this to have flexibility for our students. So generally speaking, they're mostly evening classes. There are some that are offered a little bit earlier in the day. If you were looking for any specific time, uh, I will have to default to Claudette Brooks, your academic advisor in that case. So once you would get admitted, you can get a larger detail on what the course offerings down the line look like. Uh, and she's usually going to give you that plan of study. But most of those, I would say, range from around, say, 5.30 to 6, um, all the way until around 8.30, 9 o'clock. And that is why Dr. Ran um, Ransford Edwards had to had to head out to, was for a, grad a graduate class this evening. So it kind of gives you a rough idea of what times those graduate classes usually start and end. And also, please do keep in mind, if you do have questions later, obviously, you have our contact information. I know um, Teddy's always happy to speak with our students, of course. Um, so unless one pops up, I'm going to say thank you all very much for being here this evening. Those are fantastic questions. Um, and for those of you who are watching uh, later, thanks for, as well for watching our presentation as well. So thank you here tonight. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and look forward to seeing you here at NSU in the future. Take care. Have a great night.